Hi, I'm Charlotte Slay. I've kind of got two hats, I guess, with respect to St Augustine's. First of all, I'm a student here on the ordination track in my second of three years of learning. Loving coming to West Morling every week, beautiful place to study. And my other hat is that I have been helping with the team that has succeeded in getting the Science for Seminaries grant and I've been helping the team think about how we can integrate science and science and technology studies into the curriculum here so that our students are really well equipped to, to go and live and flourish and minister in a world that is so defined by science and technology. So a little bit of background about myself. I've been in academia for 20, 25 years, teaching in a few different universities. And my field of study is a thing called science and technology studies. And if you think about what English literature is to actual literature, so when you, it's, it's studying how novels and poems work and how we interpret them and how we understand them, what I do is the same thing except with respect to science. So I understand, I, I study and understand how we make scientific knowledge and how um, that sits within culture and society in the world. And it's really interesting to me in my dual position as a scholar and as a Christian, how similar actually science and Christianity are in terms of the way that people sometimes are tempted to think about them and to think about them, I think, not terribly helpfully. And they think about really both of those systems of, of belief as, as systems of belief of uh, a set of propositions which are either true or untrue. So, you know, do we know the true facts about gravity or neutrons or, or whatever? What are the true facts of, of Christianity? And of course, when you think about them in terms of beliefs like that, it's very easy to get into that situation where you then see them as conflicting because, you know, one or the other has got to have dibs on, on, those, on those beliefs. But both of those, I think, are really, really narrow and unproductive ways of thinking about both of those, um, both of those knowledge systems. Science is uh, essentially a collaborative exercise, and it's, it's something that is best understood as the way in which we collectively decide to put our truth in a particular set of equipment or a particular set of people or a, a particular ambition, right? You know, with, you know, to go to the moon or to stop climate change or, or whatever. It's it's a it's a social and a and a collective thing, and Christianity, somewhat similarly, is just it's so much more than beliefs, isn't it? It's about uh, it's it's about how we are in the world. It's about our relationship with God. It's about how we touch the sacred. It's about it's about an encounter, I think, at the end of the day. And what happens when we encounter God and, and what is that encounter like and how are we changed by it and how do those ripples go out through the world? So yeah, for me, uh, there's the, there are these very naive and simple ways of thinking about both God and about science. And I suppose my whole um, ambition in life is to is sort of to bring those two ways of thinking together in, in productive ways that hopefully educate people and, and liberate them a little bit to be more confident and at ease in the world. Charlotte, earlier this year this college was awarded a grant um, from a project which started in the United States called Science for Seminaries. And this project has the objective of building confidence in Christian ministers of all denominations, but building their confidence in engaging with conversations about science. This addresses a very widespread problem, which is that, by and large, it seems that clergy, ministers, uh, Christian congregants um, lack confidence or feel um, that they don't have any authority or right, so to speak, to enter into such conversations, that somehow their own uh, knowledge of science is inadequate, or more seriously, that they find it very hard to um, 
reconcile their commitment to faith with what they read about and the impressions they have gained about the nature of science. So that's what the overall project uh, is all about. We've been given uh, the grant to um, implement our own version of that uh, for the benefit of our students. And so perhaps the first thing you could tell me is a little bit about how you got involved in this and uh, what you've done so far in relation to the project. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just so excited when I got the news about this grant success that St Augustine's has had, um, because it, it really brings together things that, that I've been interested in for a very long time, and that is, of course, Christianity on the one hand, but also how we think about science. And I've been involved in teaching and researching how we think about science uh, and what it means for us as a culture and a society to be scientific for a very long time. And you're absolutely right. There is often still this residual unease or anxiety for, for many Christians and Christian leaders that somehow there is a, an either or going on between faith and science and that, that one has to be true a little bit at the expense of the other. And it's such a strange thing for people to think because for, you know, two, three hundred years, philosophers and sociologists have been demonstrating that this is not the case and that, that science is no more uh, of a, a, a provable belief system than, than, than any other. Um, so I think it's just so important and exciting that some of these insights are, are understood by people who are in training for church ministry or studying theology for some other way. So it's just brilliant to be able to bring some of the, the insights and knowledge and experience from that sphere of, of my life uh, and of my teaching into, into conversation with, with the other things that are being taught here at St Augustine's. We had a planning retreat uh, for the uh, to, to kick off the the project, in which we uh, met with the organisers. We met with some scientists from the states, and we also uh, met with the other grant recipients, about eight other colleges. Some of them Anglicans, uh, uh, one Nazarene college, Pentecostal college, and a reformed Presbyterian College in uh, Edim, um, Aberdeen, I think. So it was a, quite a denominational variety. And then there were also uh, quite a few scientists who um, have an interest in matters of faith and have been engaging in thinking through their own, their own faith in relation to their scientific practice. Um, you attended a day of that uh, retreat. Um, what struck you about the conversations between the scientists there and the theologians? Yeah, there were some very interesting conversations. And as is often the way in these Zoom meetings, the most interesting conversations were the ones that were happening in the chat down the side, weren't they? And there was a real thread of people getting annoyed and frustrated about the number of times they get drawn into conversations about evolution and how so many conversations about Christianity and faith seem to sort of get sucked down that particular plug hole. And that's a really interesting one. And I think, you know, that is something that our students will, will need to be equipped to speak to. But what the scientists were excited about was the, the sheer joy and the awe and the wonder that they have through their scientific studies and the, the desire to share that with other people. And I think that's something that, that I hope we very much manage to take forward in the, in the way that we present these subjects to students. Perhaps a good way of approaching that is to go back to some of the, something that we heard in that planning retreat. There was a lady there who's actually a priest who is also um, busy taking data from the rover that's wandering over the surface of Mars at the moment. And at one point in her talk, she played us the first, I think, the first uh, recording from Mars, which was uh, the sound of Martian wind. And that, kind of, that sort of really staggered me, that I was listening to a recording made on another planet by machinery 
that human beings had sent to another planet. There was something human on Mars. And what that spun off in my mind was what an extraordinary creature this is that sends its passion for discovery and learning and its, as you say, wonder to another planet. Uh, the, um, the boldness of it, the um, extraordinary skill and intellectual understanding involved, of course, um, but the underlying desire not to stop asking questions, no matter how impossible it seems that it might be to get any answers of any kind. I mean, questions through this machine to Mars. And the questions keep going on. And that, to me, opens up many of the questions that are central when we start talking about Christian spirituality. When we talk about this desire to know and love the ultimate mystery. Um, to know and love that which will exhaust all our questions. There is in that wonder something that is entirely of a piece with the wonder that sends a strange, multi-legged, multi-wheeled uh, machine to Mars and with all its sort of scanners and, and uh, uh, regist registering machines fizzing away, uh, finding out stuff stuff about everything from atmosphere to soil, and then asking the question, well, what does this tell us about our place in the universe? I love that example. And yet there's a sort of a, an underside to it as well, isn't there? It's really strange how in the last almost two or three years, there's been this increased fascination with going into space and colonizing Mars and all of these kinds of things particularly by billionaires and over-excitable tech-type people. And yet the immediate scientific and social challenges and theological challenges that we have are very much on Earth in terms of climate and in terms of the, the ecological catastrophe that is unfolding there. And so I find it very, very strange, this kind of flight to, to, to other worlds rather than facing up to problems here. And so for me, I think that's another really important aspect of what St. Augustine's is doing through this project, and that is helping its students to engage with these questions that are going to shape the rest of their lives, the, the rest of their ministry, the lives of the people that they're serving and are in contact with from around the world. I mean, these really are unprecedented times for us as a species, that our actions, whether maliciously done or not, have, have really changed the, the, the future of the planet and in some quite terrible ways. And it's so important that the church is forming its, its ministers and its priests to be at the forefront of, of responding to that, understanding it spiritually, understanding what the grief is that we are beginning to step into, understanding how we can not just survive, but live and flourish amidst this death that we see, how we understand and practice repentance in this situation, and how we understand and receive and give redemption as well in, in a world that is in such, um, such a sorry state that is, that, that is dying around us. I mean, it's, it's huge, it's a, it's a huge thing, but you know, we, 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 can't be, we can't be blind to it. I think it, for me, it has to sit at the center of, of all the, 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 the training and formation that we, that we have. Coming from this is also a, a range of, of moral and theological, spiritual questions that relate to what is really good for human beings. Um, how can we live in a community that doesn't stop with human, the human community, but includes the animal world and the extension, the world of, uh, uh, of plants and living things. You're absolutely right that, that science is something that informs us in, in our, 
our walk of faith, I guess, uh, in terms of you know how we understand the world and 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 how we should be in the world. And what the example you're giving there is is an example of ethics, and that's very important. I think there's also other aspects that are perhaps less obvious to some people, and those are aspects where science does inform our spirituality, exactly as as we're hoping to explore in this module, and. It's, it's going beyond that step of thinking about animals as objects and trying to think, think of them ethically, but actually to think of them as created beings that are in relationship with us. And because they're in relationship with us, they are shaping us as also as, as created beings. They are giving us joy. Uh, they are... Yeah, they're, they're in some sense in communion with us as as create part of the created order. So it's sort of stepping beyond just that ethical relation to nature as objects to actually understanding it as as part of the spiritual world that we live in. And it's so interesting, I think, how science has been contributing to our understanding there and, and science and technology studies over the past generation or so the more we've come to understand about ecology and the complexity of relationships and communication that, that exist within the natural world and how we are part of that. Uh, and so when we disrupt that, that's not just that we're behaving unethically, it's that we're actually diminishing ourselves as spiritual beings in, uh, you know, who are part of the created world. And I really love that the science and spirituality module reposition spirituality in those ways there are two themes i think aren't there the one the first one is about how we are embodied creatures and how we can never divorce our spirituality from our embodiment it's really curious i think how both both science and christianity have at times been tempted to do that and you know, the, sort of the, um, you know, the, the cliche of the, of the nun locked away in a, you know, in a tiny cell and sort of denying her body. And, and, and if, if you could just get rid of your body, then you would be a spiritual being. And the weird thing is that science kind of tries to often to make the same move, to pretend that we just understand the world through our intellect, as though there were no physical ways of doing that, as though we did not use our senses to actually get that information in in the first place, and as though we were not doing it through relationships with people around the world. So I think it's so exciting to be studying, first of all, how we are embodied spiritual beings, we are evolved beings, we have a neurology that underpins our experience of, of prayer and meditation. I think that's so exciting to be doing that. And then the second one is about spirituality in common, isn't it? Yes, the, the second uh, major theme is spirituality in common, and we jump into that by thinking about the environment. But again, and I think this is a really crucial point that you made, we don't want to think about this narrowly ethically. Although the ethics is hugely important, we won't appreciate what the attention to ethics will do for us and for the world unless we move beyond it. Um, I mean, a, a little illustration might be, my dog thinks I'm stupid. And I really mean that seriously. Every morning we go out to the local park and he knows the world in a way I cannot. And he gets excited about things because he can smell them in these extraordinary ways in which dogs do. And he turns to me and wonders why I'm not scampering around with the same level of enthusiasm. Um, and one of the, the ways in which we can pay attention to the environment is paying attention to that being with another creature that is knowing and loving the world in ways that are very different from ours but nevertheless belong within the same community. And so what we're trying to do, I think, in that you know, spirituality in common is to, again, immerse us and the students, not just in our own bodies, but immersing our own bodies in all their multiple connections with the environment 
uh, with other creatures. Right, again. And again, it's back to the, the cliched nun yeah. on her own or the scientist on his own in the laboratory, the crazy scientist. And <laughs> neither of those are, are healthy ways of being in the world. Neither of, it, That's not how science gets made. Science is always made by lots of people collaborating. And, and spirituality, too, is something that we experience in common through relationship mm. through ritual my uh, a, a spirituality that i develop on my own in a, in a room and never you know that's, it's it's mm. meaningless i think i, I would say um, perhaps some people have that calling but for most of us it's about living in common and and another thing that that we'll be picking up i think is about how um in terms of technology social media yeah. is changing that and that's a really another really important scientific to address the the research that's gone on in terms of how it's rewiring our individual brains and also rewiring our collective behavior in ways that have tremendous opportunities i think i mean the, our ability to communicate around the world especially as you know, we realize the the cost of flying that's brilliant but there are other real issues for us to get our heads around as church leaders and christians yeah. We also will be asking questions like, why is it that human beings are so violent to each other? And what is the significance of the importance that Christian faith places and the importance that Jesus placed upon a different kind of response to violence? I mean, when we look at other animals, social animals, for instance, it's striking that they have all kinds of protocols that, uh, that can control violence in various or limit violence. We don't have those protocols. And one of the things spirituality is about, if it's, a, you know, if it's about anything, is how we deal not with uh, that old thing about you know, crushing our passions to the point at which we are uh, brains on sticks, but rather how do we respond to the... Uh, the human tendency to it towards destruction and towards violence to one another and therefore by ex and, uh, um, also to other other creatures and what does it do to be a disciple of the of the um, of the Jesus who says turn the other cheek love your enemies and make peace and where does God stand? Why do, we, why do we tell lots of stories about God where he seems to be a, an enlarged version of ourselves, willing, you know, enjoying nothing more than a, a dust-up and, and an opportunity to crush his enemies? Why do we continue to tell stories about that when at the heart of our faith is one who says, love your enemies? And what would that mean, not just for immediate relationships but for our political lives for our relationships with the larger environment. Mm -hmm.